Now that we understand the philosophical and ancient undertones of psychology, we're going to look at how it actually became a field of its own and turned into a science. And just to review from the last video, we know that we've got three different eras of time in psychology, the pre-scientific, the scientific, and then contemporary. Um, so we've already done pre-scientific, and then today we're going to take a look at psychology as a science. So if I were to ask people who the father of psychology is, I think 9 out of 10 people would say Sigmund Freud. And although his name is really um, familiar in modern culture, he is not the father of psychology. So who is the father of psychology? His name is Wilhelm Wundt. Not William Wundt, but Wilhelm Wundt. He's German. And he developed psychology as a science in 1879. And why is this significant? It's because he had the first psychological lab. And if he has a lab, he's measuring, he's experimenting on all these philosophical questions that people have asked for thousands of years. And this is what makes psychology an actual science and why Wundt is considered the father of it. So what was he trying to do in his lab? He was trying to break down basic components of our mind. So the best way I know how to explain it is through the periodic table of elements. Um, you know in science that everything breaks down into some sort of basic element, like water is H2O. And so what he was trying to do was break down the, the consciousness elements in our mind. Um, what are our mental limits? So, for example, like we can hear certain sounds at certain frequencies, but a dog whistle, you know, we can't hear. Or certain smells are strong to us and certain smells we can't. And so he would try and intentionally put people in experiences and then quantify those experiences. So like if he's trying to figure out what are our limits of sight, he would put people in a dark room and start entering these small iotas of light and, and record when people could actually see the light or when they perceived that they were seeing the light. Um, his first experiment ever had to deal with like he would drop a ball and just have people respond as soon as they heard the ball drop. Um, then he would drop the ball again, and he would have them um, respond when they perceived that they heard the ball drop. So it's a little different. We're going to actually recreate some of his experiments tomorrow in class. But the key thing that you need to know about Wilhelm Wundt is he is the first person to actually create an entire laboratory about measuring um, these, these questions about the human mind and, and what our brains are, are capable of. So in addition to his lab, Wundt also influenced a school of thought in psychology. And what I mean by school of thought is a specific way of thinking for the period, or for the people of the period of that time. So for example, um, schools of thought in art, you know, realism, contemporary, expressionism, abstract, surrealism, uh, schools of thought in uh, the classics of like uh, writing in architecture. So we've got like Renaissance period, the classical period, the Romantic period. Um, so all of those are examples of, of schools of thought. And so Wundt influenced the first school of thought in psychology, and we call that school of thought structuralism. And it runs from the time he had his lab in 1879 until about the 1920s. So the key focus of structuralism as a, as a scientific school of thought was the scientific study of conscious experience of our mind. Now the key figures for structuralism, we obviously have Wilhelm Wundt, the father of psychology, but you also need to remember a dude named Edward Titchener. Edward Titchener was actually a grad student of Wilhelm Wundt who did way more experimentation after Wundt was over and really structuralism should be founded on Titchener and not Wundt, but Titchener wouldn't have gotten where he was without Wundt's influence. So the key idea of structuralism is they remind, relied on introspection to explore the structures of the mind. So I highlighted this in red because introspection is a very um, specific vocab word that I think will be better to teach you in class tomorrow. So we're going to go over this tomorrow, but I wanted to give it to you now. Um, but as I mentioned in the last slide, he's studying the, the basic structures of the mind and trying to break it down into its, its smallest part, which is why it's called structuralism. So like I have this picture of the house here. You know, what is the basic structure? How do you fill how do you build a house? So the criticisms of structuralism as we get into later psychology history is that when you're dealing with the mind, it's very subjective. 
you can tell me that you're thinking something or that you're feeling something, but I can't prove it. And so um, because I can't prove it, some people had a problem with this school of thought. But um, this is structuralism and how Wundt and Titchener influenced it. Around the same time that structuralism was formed, William James was also a prominent experimental psychologist during this time, and he actually rejected structuralism. His argument was that structuralism served no point. Like, Boone was doing something cool, like mapping out the structures of the mind, but what did it matter? He wanted to know the function of the mind. And so he coined the second school of thought, which we which we term as functionalism. And so he was more concerned with, okay, we get this mental breakdown, but what are the functions, what are the uses of our mind? Also, fun fact about William James, which you don't need to remember, but he wrote the first psychological textbook, which is pretty neat. So, second school of thought, functionalism. So this is the 1890s, so slightly later than structuralism, again until the 1920s, so they were kind of competing ideas. Focus is exactly the same as structuralism, scientific study of conscious experience. Key figure, though, is William James. So we've got Boot and Titchener for structuralism and William James for functionalism. And his key idea is slightly different. He's still using that introspection, which we'll talk about tomorrow, but he's trying to understand the adaptive purpose or the function of mental processes. Okay? So if we use our house analogy, rather than looking at just the brick and mortar structures of the house, he wants to focus on the functionality of each room and what is the purpose of it serving. The criticisms of functionalism are exactly the same as the criticisms, criticisms of structuralism because it's still studying the mind, which is subjective and unreliable when we're talking about scientific measurement. Um, you know, compared to behavior, you can, you can observe behavior, you can't observe what's going on inside of your mind. So hopefully it's easy to remember the difference between structuralism and functionalism because their, their definition is in the name, okay? So if we take this medicine cabinet here, if I were a structuralist, I would be looking at the structure and makeup of the cabinet. I would be looking at the structure and makeup of each of the different medications and chemicals that are in this medicine cabinet. But if I were a functionalist with William James, I would be looking at the function of this cabinet. What's the purpose of these different medications and concoctions inside this med medicine cabinet? Okay, another example, if you just think about salt. Okay, salt has a structured breakdown. Um, I think it's sodium and chlorine, right? Um, so that would be a what a structuralist focuses on. Functionalists would focus on, okay, what does salt do? Well, it can melt ice, it can flavor food, it can preserve food. So um, hopefully it's, it's easy to remember the differences between those two schools of thought. All right, that wraps up the information for this video. So we've got pre-scientific psychology done, and we now have psychological science done as well. Um, and tomorrow in class we'll look more at what introspection is and how that applied to both structuralism and functionalism. See you tomorrow.